Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Dawn Matera Corsi, and we're going to talk a little bit about her research and a couple of the books that she wrote and uh, have some fun. So welcome, Dawn. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you. So I love the, the subject of Italian genealogy, being a second generation Italian American. So this is awesome. Glad to share the tips that, that we ran into, some of the things, how to overcome some of the obstacles we ran into. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so now you mentioned second generation Italian. I always consider myself, it, there's a lot of confusion around that. I always consider myself second generation because my parents were born here. Some mm -hmm. people say I'm third generation because my grandparents were the first generation, which I don't buy into because they were born in Italy. Right. And you're at, if, if somebody goes to Italy, even though I am of Italian, you and I are of Italian heritage, Italians consider us Americans. That's right. So you are correct. You and I are correct. We are second generation Italian Americans. So you are correct. Uh, well, I'm glad you agree with me. At least somebody agrees with me. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, as long as you and I agree, heck with everyone else. That's right. It doesn't matter. Uh, so... Now, when did you get the bug to start doing research? Interesting. Um, I've always had this strong interest growing up in an Italian-American neighborhood of, you know, oh, where's your family from? So it's always been kind of a little simmer. And then back in 2001, I took my first trip to Italy with my father and his brother, my Uncle Johnny. It was also my dad's first time to Italy. And at that point, I realized my family's from an island called Ischia, which is in the Bay of Naples. And at that time, I spoke very little Italian. And I realized that my family there and my family in the United States, that once my uncle Johnny was gone, because he was the glue, he was the connection. And once he was gone, that connection would be lost because of the language. So I actually took it upon myself to learn Italian. Not that you have to learn Italian to find your relatives in Italy. But when I did that, that's really when the strong desire to find out about my heritage and the more of the culture and an Italian American culture and Italian culture are a little bit different from each other, but that's okay. It's all good. And so that's when we started researching uh, the family. I do have a cousin in Italy that did a lot of the family tree on my grandfather's side. So that was very helpful. And when we really got involved with, when I say we, my husband and I, with the genealogy is about his side of the family. Because my family was easy to find because I had Uncle Johnny. We didn't have an Uncle Johnny on my husband's side of the family. So that took more research. <laughs> so uh, to give you some ideas about that, his family, well, let me back up a little bit. All, all of the Corsis here in the United States knew that the Corsi family came from a town called San Michele. So we figured, great, San Michele. Do you know how many San Micheles <laughs> there are in Italy? Oh, my gosh. And we heard all these stories. Oh, they lived in a castle. Oh, they were from Tuscany. So you find these random Corsis with tu uh, castles in Tuscany. Of course, we were not related to any of them. <laughs> So we still kept, I still kept looking. I thought I found out which Mike, San Michele it was uh, in Southern Italy. I was totally off base. Then it was a cousin of my husband's, Lisa, that had a photocopy of the family tomb in San Michele. And in tiny, tiny print at the bottom of this photocopy, it said, San Michele in Teverina. <gasps> Bingo. We found which San Michele. So once we found that out, then we were able to do more research. And some things that people can do is if you, if you know the town or even the region of where your family comes from, look in the Italian version of the white pages, which is Pagine Bianche, pages white. And you can look up your family's name and who knows, you might find a long lost cousin in there. So we uh, yeah, started and, down that rabbit trail. Uh, yeah, no, and that's you know that's certainly good advice. I, I I've looked at the the white pages a few times, and mm -hmm. uh, I found some Sorrentinos where uh, my great 
great-grandfather comes from in the Serie Superiore, and I never even knew that they had come from there. Uh, wow. But apparently there's a lot of Sorrentinos there. And, there you uh, go. And they eventually then, from there, made their way to Naples. But now you mentioned Ischia. I yes. have uh, a little bit of a contact with Ischia because oh. my, um, my grandmother was Pier Malo, and there's Villa Pier Malo on Ischia. And that was, um, I believe, by the time when they purchased it, I believe it wasn't her uh, great grandparents or great great grandparents. I believe it was her, one of her great uncles. Um, mm -hmm. But they they had um, they were barons in Calabria, and then, unbeknownst to me, until not that long ago, I never realized that the nobility, at least the, the southern Italian nobility. They all lived in Naples. They had their fiefdoms, but they didn't live there. They would go visit, um, mm -hmm. but they all lived in Naples. Uh, wow. And then they all had, you know, I guess, vacation homes in, on the islands, and whether it's Capri or Ischia or, or wherever. Right. Um, oh. But, yeah, it, you know, it can be a challenge, especially, you know, especially if you have a very common name. Um, right. or if, if, like you said, there's so many towns with the same name, I know I've been, I've been helping some people research and I came across the same thing. It was like, or they would give you a church and I say, well, you know, there's like 50 churches with that name in Italy. Exactly. Yeah. Narrow it down oh, a little bit. Peters. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so now your first trip to Italy had to yes. be exciting. We went the first time in, in 95 and at that time. I didn't know anything other than my mother's family was from Bari and I didn't even know they were from Torito. And I knew my father's family was from Naples. Uh, so when you went the first time, is that when you went to your, your, where your father was from? Yes, exactly. Yes, we did an organized tour of Venice, Rome and Florence. And then we went to Ischia and spent a little over a week there and met a lot of the our distant relatives and we met we even met people that knew my grandfather and grandmother so mm -hmm. that was and people that weren't even related that knew my grandparents so that was exciting and and of course it's any, anywhere you go in Italy it's beautiful and the food is great and the people are wonderful no matter where your family's from in Italy <laughs> i i know it, it isn't it amazing especially the the way they they welcome you i mean when yes. we went the first time my son was a baby and and we just really, we were living in England. We just wanted to go to Rome and, and Sorrento and just vacation. Mm. You know, we, our trip was on hold for two and a half years. I don't know if you had seen that, but we finally got to go in June and it was the most amazing thing. Um, and, and I said it on, a, you know, one or two other podcasts, but I had no idea that my father had first cousins still alive in Italy. Wow. I was completely blown away. And the, and and you probably believe like most of us crazy people who are instilled with this need to find everybody that nothing happens by accident. Right. And um just a few months before we went, I got contacted by my uh great-grandfather's grandson. And the reason this is to be is weird because my grandfather was 60. He married a woman who was 30. Wow. She was six months older than my grandmother. And he had another family with her. And mm -hmm. Nicola, who is like my father, is named after his grandfather, Nicola. My father was Nicholas. Um, he contacted me wow. and said, uh, you're going to be in Naples. I'm going to come. We're having a lunch. He said, I'm going to come. And um, we met. And he took us to meet my father's uh, first cousins. Well, he was actually my father's first cousin. Right. Right. Uh, half first cousin or whatever. But mm -hmm. my grandmother's youngest brother, uh, his daughters, two of his daughters are still alive. Wow. And he brought us to their home. And the most incredible part of the whole thing, besides being like brought back like 60 years, you know. Um, right was that they had my parents' wedding photo that <laughs> my grandmother had sent with her handwriting on the back. Yes. And I tell people, you know, it's, especially now that we've gone, 
you know, Florence is great. Rome is great. Those places are great. Right. But you have to go to these little places, especially if you know where their family comes from, because you don't know who's going to walk right. up to you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes, that's absolutely right. Yes. As a matter of fact, we have, a, uh, even if you're not positive, that, or maybe you know where the town is, where your, where your ancestors came from, but you don't know anybody. You couldn't find anybody in the Pagine Bianche. That's okay. We have a distant cousin that, um, that lives in, in the United States. He does not speak much Italian at all. He and his wife just showed up in San Michele in Teverina with photographs, old photographs. So he just went around and pointing to the picture and saying, you know, do you know this person? He knew how to say that. And, and people were like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Or for to say, for to say. And then finally he said he stood in the middle of the piazza with the pictures and just yelled his great grandfather's name. Dante Simone. And then all of a sudden, all these people came and said, oh, yeah, we know. and then he was able to find his cousin and everything else. So it doesn't have to be fancy or sophisticated to go to these small towns and find your family. You just show up, make an effort and smile. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and they know they know you're American. I mean, they they'll, they'll come and ask. Yes. Uh, yes. Who are you? You know, what are you doing here? Or, oh, you know. don't they know it in a small <laughs> town? They know who, what, whose car is that? <laughs> uh, and, and to your point about the, the openness and everything, um, when we went to Montebello uh, and Fasado, the people there, I, you know, they didn't know us from Adam. They, they were, weren't relatives, but they knew the history of the family and they still revere it. They still revere these people from 150, 200 years ago. Yes. Uh, and they spent the whole entire day with us uh, singing and dancing. I mean, it was like uh, it was like a big outdoor wedding. And and they were they were just as happy that we were there as we were to be there. That's right. That's right. We had the same experience where we went to the town hall to find, get the birth certificates of my husband's grandfather and great grandfather. And the woman that worked there, uh, she's now retired, um, but she uh, got the records for us. She said, OK, come back in an hour or whatever it was. And so we came back and got the records. We invited her out to take her out to lunch. And she said, oh, no, but we are uh, I can take you tomorrow morning to take you to the house that your grandfather was born in. And here she took us around the town. She introduced us to people. Now, come to find out later, we are related to her through marriage. But at that point, we really didn't know that. And here she's taking time out of her busy schedule to show us around the town. And was and we stay in touch. We go to their house every time we were back in town. And it is, it's how open and warm and loving they are. Now, I'm going to say 99% of them are. And the reason I say this is this. Think about this. Here you are in your home somewhere, wherever you live in the United States or England or Australia. You have some relative mm -hmm, that just shows up at your door or calls you out of the blue. And you might think, what does this guy want? So the opposite is true as well as though 99% of our Italian families, both on my husband's side and on my side, welcomed us with open arms. There were a couple that were a little skeptical. Are we back to, the big thing was the land. Are they back here yes. to take the land? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so once that you um, let them know that no, our, our intentions are pure, we are just here to discover our roots and connect with our Italian heritage, then they, they do. For, to give you a little side story on that, the, going back to the white pages, uh, before we went to San Michele and Teverina the first time, there were only three courses in the phone book. When we got to the hotel, or actually it was a castle, believe it or not. We stayed in a castle and the owner of the castle, it was it turned it into an Airbnb type thing. He called all three of them. All three of them said, no, we don't have any family in America. Okay, so we go through the weekend, we go to town hall, we get shown around, we end up going to this big party, outdoor party one night. Then the last day that we're there in town, 
We went to the cemetery to clean the tomb and put flowers just to pay our respects. And so this guy comes walking by and he, he says in Italian, he said, um, so how are you related to the family in this tomb? And I explained. And then he realized, he said, oh, well, we're cousins. And so he took us around the the the, the cemetery, introducing us, so to speak, <laughs> to his family. <laughs> and it was his grandfather was a brother of my husband's great grandfather. But here's the bottom line. He was one of those three people that the hotel owner called and said, no, we don't have any family in America. And here that we are, we're cousins <laughs> with, this, with this guy. He has since realized that no, even at that day, when he saw us there cleaning the tomb and putting flowers out, he knew that our intentions were pure and we just wanted to get to know them. And now we have a fantastic relationship with him and all of his family. Yeah, and, you know, and that's, that's interesting too because uh, they don't necessarily, just like I didn't know that I had cousins there, they don't know because it got so far removed. So, you know, the two old women knew that their uh, uh, aunt was in um, Italy, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, they she my when my grandmother passed away, and then my my father's oldest sister who uh, eventually passed away, it just got lost, you know, right. and 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 they didn't know. And uh, when we met them. Mm -hmm. It was like we knew them our entire lives. Yes, exactly. It was unbelievable. And one right. of them, one of the sisters even looked like my grandmother. I mean, a, yes. a lot like my grandmother. That's right. That's right. Yes, I agree. I one of my grandfather's first cousins is still alive on Ischia. And when we go to see her, my husband always says, he goes, wow, that's that's you when you're 90 something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I take that as a compliment. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, well, just I, just getting to 90 is, uh, is, uh, is pretty isn't good. that the truth? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of like what Nicola did when we because he knew we were going to the cemetery. So he took us to the uh, to where my great grandfather was buried with his second wife and the two daughters and, um, and Nicola's uh, father were all buried there. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, Nicola's father lived to, into the 90s. He just passed away a few years ago. Oh, wow. Um, but the other amazing thing about that whole connection was uh, since we had met and after we came back, he went looking through his mother's stuff and he found... Back then, you know, back in the 20s, they would send a postcard with a picture on it. Yes, right? exactly. And he found postcards that my grandmother sent to her father, written in her name, mm -hmm. and signed with the nickname. The, her name was Luigia. Mm -hmm. She signed it Georgina. So yes. that must have been her nickname with her yes. father. Never knew. Yeah. So 100 yep. years now go by, and this is what we discover. So... You know, that's why mm -hmm. I, I tell you, you know, sometimes you have to walk away a little while. Yes. But don't give up because you never know what you're going to come across. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We found after my grandparents passed away, we found some postcards that my grandfather sent to my grandmother. He was in America already. She was still in East Gear. And the postcards, part of it was they were so romantic. We never knew this side of grandpa before. And, and it was it was beautiful. And one of the, the interesting things he would now he had been in the United States maybe a year or so. And he signed the 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 postcards. Uh, you know, things first of all, he'd say things like, You are the star of my sky, you are the light in my night. I mean, just all this squishy stuff. And and he would sign it, I'll spell it for you. G U B A I. Again, what the heck is that? And if you pronounce that phonetically in Italian, it was goodbye. No, goodbye. Goodbye. So he was trying to <laughs> phonetically trying to get a little English oh, in there. That's so cool. I know. No. That's a great. That's, a, that's, a, that's great. That's great. <laughs> now, do you know why he came from Ischia? Because Ischia is a beautiful place. Uh, oh yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Ischia today is a beautiful place. But he came in the early um, 1920s. 
he came to America. And like most people of that generation, they were coming for a better life, especially from Southern Italy, that they came uh, to build something here in America for their families. And then like in this case, it was my grandmother and, and her mother uh, that came to the United States after that, after he had established himself. My grandfather was a concrete mason. And so he uh, ended up working for a big construction company here. And, and so it was purely economic. Now, at the same time, my grandmother's brother, Uncle Mike, Zio Michele, who was the youngest sibling, he came to America but he and he said he and I've taught I had talked to him and he about he said he lasted about six months. He couldn't take he had to go back home and because he missed Ischia so much. But, you know, back in the 20s and 30s, Italy was uh, and, and then even after World War Two, there was yeah. still the rebuilding. So that's why a lot of um, not all Europeans, a lot of Europeans came to the U.S. during that time frame. Yeah. Um, and uh, my grandmother's oldest son. Uh, my uncle John, he he didn't come with his whole family until 1950, and they mm -hmm. still they still had they didn't have indoor plumbing. Yes, yes, yep, yeah. When my uncle Johnny was in, he was stationed in Germany during the Korean War, and so he did take a weekend trip down to Ischia one time, and it wasn't. But most of them at least had indoor plumbing, but still the, the mode of transportation on the island of Ischia was donkey. So fast forward to 2000, when my me, my dad, and my Uncle Johnny are talking about going to Italy, my dad had this picture in his head thinking, <laughs> oh my gosh, we're going to be riding around on donkeys. <laughs> so, so he was pleasantly surprised that they actually have automobiles now, <laughs> and yeah, well, everyone has indoor plumbing. <laughs> when you go through some of those roads in, in the old city of Naples, you should be on a donkey, certainly not on a car. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, and I'm sure this is true in some other small towns, here we were, 2001, we're sitting on the piazza, which is on, uh, Ischia is volcanic, so it's like a mountain. And where our family is, it's towards the top of the mountain. So here it is, uh, I don't know, Saturday, Sunday morning, it's pretty quiet, and we're sitting out on the, the, the patio, looking down the hill, and we can hear an ambulance. So you have this big ambulance, followed by what I call a little baby ambulance dee -doo, dee -doo, dee -doo, going down the road. And so we're, we had to ask our cousin that owned the, the restaurant and hotel where we were staying, we're like, what's the deal with the little baby ambulance? He said, some of the roads are so narrow that the regular size, now the regular size ambulance is really just a minivan, like mm -hmm. a soccer mom van yeah. at that size. So the little baby ambulance goes down, gets the person, brings them back up to the big ambulance, and then they go to the hospital. That's how small some of those roads are. Yeah, yeah, we saw that um, certainly in, in Montebello, and you know the choice. And you know, you think to yourself, how did they do this? And you know, these donkey carts, and you know, on or on, you know, horse-drawn carriages and things like that. Yes, like I know, you know, my my, my grandmother's family. They had their places in Capricota behind me and Montebello. Uh, and, you know, it was four or five hours to get to these places from Naples by car. Yes. So you could imagine what the trip must have been like 100 right. years ago, 150 years ago when they were on. Right. And they would do it once or twice a year, they told me, that they would go yeah. back and forth. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we were thinking about that too. How do they? How do they get people? You know, if somebody gets sick or something like that, what do they do? But I didn't know about the baby ambulance. And <laughs> now you do. <laughs> uh, so now you've written a couple of books, yeah. Yes. Um, and um, so tell us about what the two books are about. I know there's sure. a picture of one behind you there. Yes, yes, the Italian art of living. That's my most recent book, and of course, they're always with a with a writer. Books are always in my head, getting getting out there. My first book I wrote about twelve years ago, and it's called La Bella Figura. And at that time, I didn't know what uh, I didn't know what questions to ask a publisher. So don't get the print copy; get the ebook, much more economical. But the Italian art of living: your passport to hope, happiness, and your personal renaissance is the book. It came out at the end of 2020, and it's really about uh, taking the spirit of Italian passion, perseverance, and how to incorporate it into our lives today, so we can create our own dolce vita 
So there are the chapters that cover uh, what I call the tenets of the Italian culture of family, friends, faith, and of course, food. <laughs> <laughs> and and again, just that. And, uh, and a lot of this, the, the, the spirit of perseverance took place, we witnessed this during the, the pandemic, where, you know, here, Italy was one of the hardest hit nations in the world. And while we here in the United States were hoarding toilet paper and hand sanitizer, they were singing to each other from the balconies, showing movies on the sides of buildings. Uh, when they opened things up for um, that people could go out to a restaurant, but you had to eat outside. I remember there was a coffee shop in Naples that there were these, uh, some of the, you've probably seen this in Naples where you have the street and then they have these poles mm -hmm. on the sidewalk to prevent people from driving onto the sidewalk. Well, this guy took these discs of wood and made tabletops and put them on top of those poles. So now he had outdoor seating that people could have their, their espresso or cappuccino. <laughs> so I love that spirit of making, uh, you know, life gives you lemons, make limoncello. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because we did go to a restaurant in Naples. Now, he he didn't have the tables on top of, of the, the, the pillars like you mentioned, but he did have tables outside the restaurant across the street. So now that you mention it, probably that's what he did. Because yes. it certainly wasn't his property. It was like... Right. And, yep. But in Italy, that doesn't seem to matter too much. <laughs> no, right, right, right. Yep. As long as you're not causing any trouble for anybody, you're good. <laughs> like, like when we were in Montebello, we were outside the, the, the palazzo of my great-great-grandparents. And uh, it's owned now by somebody else. And I've, mm. that was one of the saddest parts of the trip. Uh, it's in such disrepair. And... Um, the, the commune wanted to buy it um, mm -hmm. 10 years ago and he wouldn't sell it. They wanted to buy it and fix it. And, uh, but we were there for a couple hours and uh, we got on the conversation of that, you know, the guy who owned the property and everything. And I said, I said, he doesn't care. And they were like, hey, doesn't matter. I said, and they said, he's probably watching us. Uh, <laughs> But we're not doing, you know, again, we're not doing any harm, you know, just so he doesn't care. Well, eventually he came out, he came over. He lives, he doesn't live in the, in the, in the palazzo anymore. He lives, but he lives on the property. I, I guess sure. he built another house or two. Um, and uh, he finally asked what was going on, I guess. And he, then he said, he asked if we would want it to go inside. And I was like, of course we want to go inside. Absolutely. I'm pass this up. That's um, right. And the saddest part about it, like I said, was you could see from the ceiling and the walls the way this place was decorated at one point in time. Yes. Uh, and it, I mean, it's gorgeous, or was. And yeah. it's just, uh, you could see I'm getting emotional about it. It was yeah. so sad to see that they wanted to they want to preserve this place and he won't he won't sell it and they oh. offered him a good chunk of money too sure right um, but oh. and, and you know again what they told me was on the on the bottom of it were the stables and they had a silkworm uh um what would you call it farm i guess wow and they would that was one of the industries that they had sure silk. And then they wow. lived, and then they lived upstairs. Yeah. Um, wow. So it was, that's yeah, fascinating. It was really something, right? Um, and, then, and then we did go into the um, in Montebello itself. The palazzo there is still there. Somebody lives in the center part of it, mm -hmm. and he actually let us go inside, and we got to go out on the balcony. And Beautiful. Wave. <laughs> oh, I love it! I love it. But you know, to your point about the way they live, when well, by the time that because we were there for two weeks, and by the time mm -hmm. we finished, and we had this all set up with Italy mm -hmm. rooting and everything like that, mm -hmm. and after Montebello, I said to Letizia, I said, you know, I said now I feel, now I feel like I'm Italian, right? You know, right? And, yes. And they, you know, they know we're American, and everything, but they don't treat you like an American. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. 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 Our family in San Michele, they call us San Michelesi. 
Sami yeah. people of Sami. Yeah, that's what they call how they refer to us now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 quite amazing. Uh, yeah. And you know, they had given us. A, they made me an honorary member of the association in Montebello and and all Beautiful. that kind of stuff. So, like I said earlier, for people listening. They they're just as happy that we're there as we are to be there. They're, they were so excited. Exactly, exactly. Because you think about it, and we are expressing interest in yeah. them and their culture and their history. Uh, and so, yeah, they're they're honored that we're interested. So, absolutely, they are very excited to see us there. Yes, and you know that's the other thing we learned too. They are extremely proud of their culture. Of and I'm not a religious guy, but of their religion, every single church you go into, even in the smallest town, impeccably clean. Yes. Flowers. Yes. And a sense of, you know, you you feel like there's a presence there, unlike yeah. going into the churches that were built here, you know, 50 years ago. Right. All modern kind of stuff. Modern, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, because you you know you go in there. And the right. paintings and the statues and everything are a thousand years old. That's right. That's right. Think of all the heritage, all the history, how many people have been there. And yeah, yep, it's it's awesome. It's it there's some, nothing like connecting like that. You're right. Can't have a conversation about Italy without the food. Uh and when when we went to that, I'll call it a, a picnic. I don't know what they would call it in Italian, but but right. picnic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they but, do. Uh, there was nothing store bought. No, was... heavens no. <laughs> and the, that's the whole thing about la bella figura, which figuratively means making a good impression. So you would never bring something store bought, or if you did buy it at the store, you put it in your own homemade container. So they think you made it at home. <laughs> you would never show up with a box from, you know, the local bakery or heaven forbid stop and shop or something. <laughs> uh, yeah. They had, they, they had uh capicola, which, which I tasted and I said uh, to one of the people there, I said, I, we don't have ham like this in America. And she said, yes. oh, well, we still make this the same way we did 200 years ago. Exactly. They kill the pig on the day after Christmas. Yes, and, my family does that too. And yep. they cure it until March, and now you eat it. <laughs> right, right. And it was so yeah. just like so matter of fact. You know? Right, like don't doesn't everybody do this? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the olives were cured. The, the cheese yes. was made there. The wine, of course, was right. you know, uh, there. Right. Uh, and yeah. um yeah. So, yeah, and my family on uh, Ischia, one one group of the family, there are, let me see, one, two, three, four, there are five families that live in this uh, huge plot of land. And so, uh, you know, most uh, houses in Italy are really what you and I might call condominiums. So there's a three story and then a two story over there on that property, aside from their houses, which are spotlessly clean mm -hmm. and beautiful and, and homey and warm and inviting and pictures everywhere. Um, they also have the grape yard, the grape vines. They have the pigs. They have chickens. They, ha they have all the vegetables and fruits. The only thing they actually have to buy is bread and pasta. They could be self-sufficient right there if they needed to. <laughs> That's amazing. That's great. It is. That's great. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, and we were we were driving down the road one place, and they, you know, they had the food stands that we don't have anymore, right? Right. And uh, I remarked something about about it, and he said, "Oh, well, you know, they don't need refrigeration." He said because whatever they buy today is sold by tonight. That's right. And then tomorrow morning, they get more. Right. That's right. Yes. And they, uh, the Italians cook seasonally. They go to the grocery store almost every day. And so they cook what they go to the grocery store. They're going to cook and eat tonight. Therefore, you don't have all the preserve, not to go off on a health kick here on this, uh, with this interview, but they don't have all the preservatives that you and I have in our foods here because they are going to consume it before it spoils. So maybe that's part of why um, Italy, especially Sardinia, is one of the blue zones, but meaning it's an area 
that has a very high percentage of people that are over a hundred. And part yeah. of it is the way that they eat. They eat that Mediterranean diet. Yeah, we met we met Libertori and Avellino, 96 years old. Uh, and he entertained us playing the accordion, singing, dancing. It must have been 100 degrees in this little olive oil shop we were in. And he, you wouldn't. I was getting tired watching this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and dressed yeah. in, you know, dressed in costume, and and um, you know that was that was the other thing that you, you come away with that they're very very proud people. Yes. Very proud of their heritage, their history, um, and mm -hmm. you know the, the the past is the past. Some mm -hmm. of it was good. Some of it was not mm -hmm. so good. But it's still mm -hmm. revered. It's still part of their soul, if you will, you know? That's right. That's right. That's an excellent way to put it. It is part of their soul. They're very proud of it. And a lot of towns do have uh, traditional celebrations at, at certain times of the year. And so that would be something that if, if, you know, the people that are watching and listening, that if you do know where your family's from, try to coordinate your trip that it falls into the time period of when there is a, a festival of some kind, because it will really get you meeting not just your family, but the community. And you'll see the heart of that community or where they're from and how they celebrate. And it, it's, it's fun too. <laughs> right. And the fact that they've been doing it for five, 600 years. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and um, I forget what they call it, but they have, um, they have that event, especially where there, there's a lot of farming let's say they they produce figs or something like that yes they have a whole celebration around the fig around the tomato or around yes. the almond or whatever right yeah they're called a, a sagra a, what yeah. we call a fee or a festa something they call it a festa right it'll be just for garlic or just for tomatoes yeah, or just yeah, for yeah. cherries whatever they're uh yeah we just found my husband loves porchetta sandwiches we just found out that there we just missed it if we were in italy last week we would have been able to go to the porchetta festival <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah we had um when we were in the olive oil store they they brought out again didn't know us um but wanted to show and, and fantastic olive oil but uh they fed us there too but they had cherries there they tasted like cherries. Yes. <laughs> they didn't taste like something that was shipped from 1,000 miles or 2,000 miles away in, in a exactly. box. Exactly. You know? Right, right. R ripened in the box, transported to yeah, us, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. The, it's true. The, and and, um, and um, you might edit this story out. It's, I know you're going to edit link. But just to tell you about the thing about preservatives and foods in Italy and language. And here's the other thing. A lot of adults, I didn't start learning Italian until I was almost 40. So adult, granted, kids learn a language faster, but adults, we still can learn the language. But our biggest thing with adult learners of Italian is we're afraid we're going to look foolish. So first of all, we are going to look foolish. So at least we're doing making, making an effort. So to give you an example, so to take away all of your fear of learning Italian at an older age. I was in Italy my second trip had a big Sunday dinner with a friend of the family. So I didn't really know these people. And somebody asked me, Dawn, which is better, American food or Italian food? And so in my limited Italian, I was saying, said something like, the recipes are pretty much the same, but the biggest indifferent is the ingredients. Now, pause for a second or aside. Most of the times you can take an English word, throw an O or an A at the end, <laughs> And you've got the Italian word. So here I am, very proud. I said, oh, yes. Well, here in Italy, the food has less preservativi. Because I think preservative, preservative, you add an O. Conversation stopped. <laughs> and then everyone started laughing. So obviously, I made a mistake. Well, the thing is this. Preservative in Italian means condom. <laughs> So I now know that it's conservanti. <laughs> yes. So as you can see, I tell all my Italian students this, you will make mistakes, but it makes for a great story later. <laughs> Feel free to edit that out, Bob. <laughs> no, that's a great story. I love it. Uh, well, it's, 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 like, um, it's, it's like in England, you know, we lived in England for two years and there were certain things um, like, like a serviette. Right. Yes. 
Yes. You don't ask for a napkin in the restaurant <laughs> in England. <laughs> I'll leave to everybody. Look it up. Everybody look it up. Right, right. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Instead of someone in England, instead of saying someone come, oh, I'm going to come and uh, call you. I'm going to come and knock you up. Knock at you up. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> that happened to my friend Joyce. She worked for British Airways 50 years ago or something like that. And uh, she went over to England and the, and the guy asked if he could, he asked, uh, can I knock you up in the morning? <laughs> 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 That's hysterical. <laughs> and she was like, oh, and the same thing with an eraser. They no. call they they call it you know a, a, a rubber. Rubber, correct. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So don't worry if your Italian's not very good. Really, like my husband, he knows all the swear words and how to sing happy birthday in Italian. <laughs> so you, as long as you are making an effort when you're there, they will more than meet you halfway. And especially in the bigger towns, Rome, Florence, Milan, uh, Catania, they, they know English. So as long as you are polite and don't assume or demand that they speak English, they will more than meet you halfway. Uh, but even if you don't know the language, just the fact that you are making the effort, they'll be happy with that. Yeah, and I found that in, in the little coffee shop I used to go to every morning in, in Naples. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't speak mm -hmm. English. I didn't speak Italian. But we got by, and by the yes. sixth day, I was able to order a little bit in Italian, and he yes. could answer. And it was it was, it was was fun. You know, yes. it, was, it yes. was fun. It was interesting. And uh, like you said, it's, you know, I didn't expect anybody to speak English. You know, we right. had a couple of drivers that didn't. Thankfully, nowadays, you have the little translator on the phone. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, you know, whether I tried to say it or whether I showed it to him, you know, the, we, we got right. by. Um, exactly. Pretty good. <laughs> so so um, before we go, uh, yes. where could everybody find your, your books and your website? Yes. Yes. Um, the books are available on Amazon. And, and anywhere books are sold. So even your local bookstore will get it for you. And uh, my website is my name, www.dawnmatera.com. So I, I created the website before I got married. So <laughs> the course now is I, the married part. Now, Matera, now, are they from Matera? Is that? Uh, no. Inter oh, interesting you should ask this. But you were asking how about the genealogy part. Um, the Matera side of my family, uh, so Materas and Iaconos, or and actually in Italy, they pronounce it Matera and Iacono. So the Iacono is my grandmother's side. Matera is my grandfather's side. If you go to Ischia, you will notice a lot of Greek architecture, whereas Capri or Capri has a lot of Roman architecture. That's because the Romans vacationed in Capri, whereas uh, a lot of Gr the Greeks li uh, lived on Ischia for a long time. And, and, and so what happened is that the, the Mataras come from Matera in southern Italy. Of course, that was with one T. So over time, it became two T's. And my, if you go back far enough, so I finally did some research on Italian genealogy websites. Why didn't I think of that sooner? <laughs> and it does actually go back to Greece. Uh, the Iacono side uh, comes from Spain eventually, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, uh, specifically in uh, where Barcelona is. So it was funny when I went to Barcelona, I said, why do I feel so connected here? <laughs> and, and that's that's why. So yes, Matera eventually became two teams. Yeah, because uh, I mean, we were, we, we were hoping to go to Matera because we, but I had to make some changes to the trip because my cousin's uh, daughter was having her first baby and the airfare went up so much. So we never made it to Puglia. So right. hopefully next year we're going to get to that side and exactly. uh, get to my, you know, where my mother's family is from. Um, right. And, um, um, it's, I have, it's being looked at by the publisher now. I, I finally got around to finishing my book and it's called nice. Far Farmers and Nobles because my mother's family was farmers and my grandmother was nobility. And mm -hmm. had they been in Italy, they never would have crossed paths, of course. That's right. The families were in America. It's, you know, all bets are off and you, you do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> right. But the interesting story about my, my father's mom and dad, my grandfather was actually in the seminary studying to be a priest. Wow. 
So I always heard the story growing up that my grandfather would say that my grandmother would come by and, and flirt with him. <laughs> my, my grandmother was very, very pretty. Um, but then later on, I found out from one of my cousins that the real story was uh, her fancy, dancy carriage broke down in front of the seminary. And he was outside, and he helped them to repair the carriage, and they gave him a ride someplace, and that was that. Wow. So, Copal di fulmine, a, a lightning strike. He was yeah, in love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is he was, uh, even at that time, he wasn't of the same uh, status as my grandmother. He was mm -hmm. from a gentrified family. His father was a mm -hmm. lawyer, okay. uh, later became a... Um, later became a Supreme Court Justice, I'm told. I haven't been able to prove that yet, but that's what he said in his obit. So I'm Right, sure. right. Um, the, and the only thing I could think of is, even though my grandmother was from two noble families, first, she was a woman. Mm -hmm. And second, she was way down the chain of anything. So mm -hmm. they probably just figured, well, you know, we need she needs to get married at some point in time so <laughs> he's as good as anybody else you right, know, by, that right. time it's, by that time it's you know 1903 this you know the it's 50 years after the unification and all that stuff right. so i think the rules by then probably started to change um and the the, the other interesting part of the story is that my great-grandmother died in 1902 mm. um at 40 years old a year after her youngest son. So I don't know if I had something to do with the birth or whatever. It's, mm. it's unclear. Mm -hmm. You can't tell from the death record. Mm. But she lived um, in a, a row of houses across the street from the Caracciolo Palace, which is now mm -hmm. the hotel in Naples. If you've heard of, uh, mm. if you know the Hotel Caracciolo. In oh, Naples, okay. That was, wow. that was my family's. Wow. Right. So across Via Carbonara, where you see all those row houses, that's where my grandmother was, uh, my great-grandmother was born wow. and died. And when you look at all the records, everybody has, was either 23, 28, 30, 32, via Carbonara. So they must have owned this row of houses right. that the family got to use. And um, almost immediately after my grandmother, my great-grandmother passed away, my grandfather, my great grandfather, had to go back to Massa di Soma, where the Piramalos were from, because I guess they had other people waiting in line. Oh, um, sure. So he had to go back to where his family was from. Very right. crazy the way they did these things. Because I yeah. couldn't, I couldn't figure out why my grandmother was back in Chercola and why, not in Naples. And right. then I finally, you know, I finally put it together that he probably had to leave because this family was so big right. and there was probably somebody next in line. And since mm -hmm. he was no longer married to one of the family. Right. That, that sounds about go. right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we got to, we got to, um, the amazing thing about the hotel is that even though it's modernized, when you walk in it, it's got the same, the stone walls right. and the stone floor. Right. So, you know, you've almost transformed back, you know, 500 years or whatever. Exactly. You know? Beautiful. And that's, and that's the funny thing about a, a lot of, like you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you, you go into the houses and they're all beautiful inside. The outside sometimes don't look so beautiful, but when you go in. You're inside, right. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like you you transformed. You go from the, the you know the 14th century to the the 21st century. Right, by exactly. Walking through a doorway. Right. <laughs> um, well, this has been certainly a lot of fun. I you know, like you, I love these stories. I love hearing the stories, and I yeah. love having the conversation. And uh, absolutely, we'll we'll keep in touch. Yes, we will. And buona fortuna, and uh, ci vediamo presto. We'll see each other soon. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely.